The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew. When Jesus heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew to Galilee. He left Nazareth and went to live in Capernaum by the sea, in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali, that what had been said through Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled. Land of Zebulun and land of Naphtali, the way to the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who sit in darkness have seen a great light, on those dwelling in a land overshadowed by death, light has arisen. From that time on, Jesus began to preach and say, Repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. As he is walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and his brother Andrew, casting a net into the sea. They were fishermen. He said to them, Come after me and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed him. He walked along from there and saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee, mending their nets. He called them, and immediately they left their boat and their father and followed him. He went around all of Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and curing every disease and illness among the people. The gospel of the Lord. After our Lord's baptism by John, he withdrew into the desert for 40 days to prepare for his mission. Now, He has come out. He's heard that John has been arrested and martyred. However, our Lord begins his mission in the area of Galilee. So this is the uppermost part of Palestine, above Judea, where Jerusalem was, above Samaria, and now the northern part. This is the land of the ancestral families of Jacob, namely Zebulun and Naphtali. It's fitting because Jesus came not just for the Jews, he came for the Gentiles. About 700 years before our Lord, the Assyrians had invaded that area of northern Israel and they had settled, colonized. So this was now a mixture of Gentile and Jew. It was known as Galilee of the Gentiles. So it is fitting. Jesus came to proclaim his message to all people. The message is simple. Repent. Reform your life. It means turning our lives over to God, no matter who we are. He's come to reveal to all people the truth of God and the love of God. He's coming to proclaim a kingdom. Not a kingdom in the physical sense of old King David's kingdom a thousand years earlier, a physical kingdom but a spiritual kingdom, a kingdom of grace, a kingdom built on God's truth and love, justice and peace. All who are called to live that kingdom, this kingdom will be made visible by the church. Those who are the believers who are called to live that life of grace. Seeing that the mission needs to be carried on, To the end of the world, our Lord calls the first apostles. We hear of him calling Peter, his brother Andrew, then James the Greater, his brother John, and eventually eight others. They leave everything. They left their homes, their occupations, their friends, their family, all to follow Christ. For three years they learned. So they saw his miracles, they heard his teachings, they had their private instruction, In all, our Lord was calling them to come out of themselves, to open up their hearts, 
to see beyond the confines of this world, this little time and space, and envision God's work at work in this world, and to make the sacrifices to bring that work to fruition. He's calling them to see beyond their own selfishness and recognize the needs of others. He's calling them to see beyond even the limits of this life and have the hope of eternal life, the fulfillment of that kingdom. And all these apostles learned, with that three years of training, these apostles at the Last Supper were officially ordained as priests. Then, after Easter, they had another 40 days of instruction with our Lord. At the Ascension, they were commissioned to go out, to make disciples, to preach the gospel, to baptize in the name of the Trinity, and to teach everything he had commanded. Filled with the gifts of the Holy Spirit, that's exactly what they did. They went to the vastness of that Roman Empire, and they founded the church. They made the sacrifice. All of those apostles, except St. John, who survived the means of execution, died as martyrs, but their blood really was the seeds of faith for others. When we look at this glimpse of the gospel, we find a very beautiful part of our church, that apostolic mark, a great gift, a very sacred gift. Who we are, what we're about, is apostolic, meaning founded on the apostles. Our church is apostolic in its leadership. So Christ ordained his apostles as priests, and we would say the first bishops, and then they hand it on through that sacrament of holy order to hand on their authority to bishops, to bishops, to bishops, and by extension to priests. How beautiful it is to know that your priests, your bishops, have an authority that goes back to those apostles and ultimately to Christ. A special authority was given to St. Peter, the first pope. That too has been handed on to our present Holy Father, Pope Francis. So the apostolic leadership is a great mark of our church. Secondly, our church has that apostolic teaching authority. Jesus told the apostles to teach at the Last Supper. He told them he would give them the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Truth, who would enlighten them, guide them, not only to teach, but to understand. So these apostles in the early church, by the Holy Spirit, said, yes, these 46 books of the Jewish scriptures that we call our Old Testament, we will preserve, and these new 27 books that we call the New Testament, we will preserve. This is our Bible, the Word of God. The church is the one who put that together and said, these are the inspired words of God. The Second Vatican Council clearly taught that that which is asserted by the inspired human authors, like St. Matthew, must, said, must be said to be asserted by the Holy Spirit, so that the words of sacred scripture teach firmly, faithfully, and without error, that truth God wanted us to have for our salvation. It doesn't stop there, though, because as we know, the Bible doesn't have all the answers, like about nuclear war, about bioethics issues, and so on. So the church teaches. It takes this truth, the living word of God, and by the Holy Spirit teaches so that you and I, right now, can live an authentic Christian life. Therefore, if you ever have a question about life, if you ever have a concern or a doubt, don't go to the Washington compost. Don't go to the New York slimes. Go to the Bible. Go to the catechism of the church. It's there. That's God's truth, not popular fleeting opinion. We have God's truth and we're called to conform our lives to that truth. Our church is apostolic in its worship. What we do now goes back to the apostles. The Mass really hasn't changed. Maybe translation, maybe added a few prayers here and there, 
but the basic mass has not changed. And we have the seven sacraments. So these divine instruments that Christ instituted by which he gives us grace. How beautiful to know that we know that we receive today the body, blood, soul, and divinity of our Lord. Our church is apostolic in its work. We carry on the work of Christ. Never forget, it's the church who provided the first hospitals, orphanages, facilities to care for the poor, the homeless, the aged, the schools that educated everyone, not just the nobility, and we could go on, and also the first universities. Why? Because it's Christ's work. The government never became involved in these aspects until about 200 years ago, but the church carries on the mission of Christ. So we have this apostolicity that is a beautiful mark of our church. Now with that said, if anyone ever asks you, why are you a Catholic? Why don't you belong to the church of what's happening now? We have a band, we have a slick pastor, you can do whatever you want to do, feel good. Why don't you belong to that church? Well, that's like saying, I'll eat at McDonald's instead of Dante's. No, we're going to go to where we're fed the best. As the Vatican Council said, the fullest means of salvation subsist within the Catholic Church. Also, it's interesting that just about a month ago, an Anglican bishop, his name is Gavin Ashenden, who was a chaplain to Queen Elizabeth in London, who is the official head of the Church of England, became a Catholic. And he said, I came to realize that only the Catholic Church, with the weight of the magisterium, had the ecclesial integrity, theological maturity, and spiritual potency to defend the faith, renew society, and save souls in the fullness of faith. If you asked Father Sly, whom I'm sure you remember, who it, he himself was an Anglican bishop at one time, became then a Catholic, then a Catholic priest, he would say the exact same thing. With that said, though, we don't become smug about this, but rather, we have to face a challenge. Jesus called those apostles. He sent them out. And so we're called to go out and continue the mission. So we need courage. We need courage for you parents. You parents have to have the courage to have a home that is really a Christian home. Your home should reflect this church. How you live, how you talk, how you entertain yourselves, whatever it may be, your home should truly be a Christian home. And that takes courage in our world today. We need courageous young people. Christ called the apostles. Christ still calls young men to be priests. Christ calls young women to be religious sisters. We have to pray that these young people have the courage to open their hearts to receive the call and at least give it a try. But I can say to any young people that if you really open your heart, you give it a try, and if it is really God's will, you will find real happiness and joy that this world cannot give. We should be proud as a parish too. We're one of the youngest parishes in our diocese, and yet we've had two ordinations to the priesthood. One young lady took final vows as a Dominican sister, and we have three seminarians. We should be very thankful that these young people had the courage to say yes. We also have to have the courage to teach the faith. You'll notice we have our Catholic school children here serving in the choir, being the lectors, this is Catholic Schools Week. We should recognize the importance of teaching the faith. The beauty of Catholic education is that it's not just about academics. It's about the spirituality. The whole day is focused on what I just said in the homily. It is about the apostolic leadership, the apostolic teaching, the apostolic worship, 
the apostolic service. That's all part of the education. Where else can we find that? Now, the church then, here, our parish, then finds a linkage to what's taught at that school, which hopefully then is linked to what's taught at home, and it works together to help a young person not only embrace the faith, but live the faith, not just now, but forever. And here we're so blessed that we have so many good, dedicated faculty who are willing to make sacrifices to teach the faith, parents who I know make sacrifices. I can honestly say to you, though, if I were a parent today and I had children, I would be very concerned about what is happening in our public schools, about the indoctrination and the immoral doctrination that our kids are receiving. As taxpayers, I think we should all be offended to know that $2 million of our taxpayer money for this county went to buy deviant library books for our school system. We should be concerned. And that is even a greater motive for you all as parents to consider what kind of education do you want your children to have. No school is perfect, but we want a school that's going to care not only for the brain, but also the soul of a child. And we also have to have courage then to be the missionaries in today's world. Don't be afraid to speak about your faith. Don't be afraid to tell the truth. Those apostles did, but we're called to have the courage to be the witnesses of the faith. For the challenge is ours today. Like the apostles, we've been called, we've been sent, and we are therefore challenged, commissioned, to go out and renew the face of the earth. May God bless you.